not as warm as it could be. <laughs> Get ready, ladies. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is House, and I am the student pastor here. And it's just a great honor to stand in these waters before you this morning. We get to observe the ordinance of baptism as we get to baptize two ladies who've given their lives to Jesus Christ. Here at Southern Crescent, we do this by immersion for a couple of reasons. One, we see it in Scripture as the way that Jesus was baptized when it talks about him going into the Jordan. It says that he came up out of the water, and it's a word that literally means to be immersed and to come out of that water having been under. It's a picture that we see in Corinthians where Paul talks about the new life that we have in Christ, that the person says, this is the old me who lived for myself, and now I've been baptized and buried with Jesus Christ and raised again to newness of life, and this is the new person who lives for Jesus and desires for him to be Lord of their lives. And so it's just that incredible picture that we get to see of what Jesus does for us. And so we thank you for coming today, and hopefully you will be blessed by this. So first coming is Jillian Biddington. <laughs> All right, this is my good friend Jillian. Uh, she accepted Christ when she was in middle school uh, and has just gotten busy with life. And God has revealed to her that she needed to be baptized in order to be obedient to him. And so she came and she wants to follow through in baptism today. Uh, if you are a friend or family member of Jillian, would you please stand for a moment that she could be encouraged by you? Awesome. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Jillian, what is your profession? Jesus is Lord. Jillian, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And now coming is Courtney O'Neill. This is Courtney, who uh, is one of our students, but also my neighbor. She lives uh, right behind us, so I've known her for years and years. Uh, but this year at youth camp, she trusted Jesus Christ in a, in a great little way that God reveals himself to us. As she was last night waiting, and her highlighter rolled from her lap down to my feet, and she came to pick it up and said, uh, I guess while I'm here, I need to talk to you. And uh, we talked, and she trusted the Lord. It's awesome just the, <laughs> the things God gives us. And so she's coming to be baptized today. And so if you are a family member, a friend of Courtney, would you please stand for a moment and encourage her? Awesome. You can be seated. Courtney, what is your profession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Courtney, it is my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Such a great day. Such a great day. Would you join me as we pray this morning? Father, I thank you so much for redeemed lives. I thank you for two young ladies who not only live for you, but have desired to be obedient to you. And I thank you for stirring their hearts to be baptized and to follow through with this. God, I pray that this has been an encouragement to the church here, that we would rejoice when lives are redeemed. But also, Lord, that you would stir hearts of any other person who maybe has trusted in you and have never been obedient to come into these waters, that, that they would have the courage to do so as well. We thank you for the time that we have to be your church right now. And as we get ready to worship you in song, we just want to lift high the name of Jesus. And we pray that you would stir all of our hearts to know you, to love you more, and to walk with you each and every day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you will, stand and join as we worship and we celebrate our Savior this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who is. i 
sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up on that this morning to sing about his praises, about his solid foundation that he gives to those who have called him their own. As we've seen in the baptistry this morning, um, what a blessing it is to have him as our Savior.
1 Peter, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
think we ought to sing just a bit more of that. Hallelujah. Praise the one who said be free. Hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Saturday night, June 1978. I'd grown up in church all my life, but the Holy Spirit of God came and convicted my heart and showed me that I was desperate and hopeless without Jesus. On that night, I gave my heart and life to Christ and never been the same. And I hope that you could say the same today. And if you haven't ever done that, today's your day. Today's your day. And as we prepare to give, that's why we give. We give out of gratefulness for what God's done for us, and we give so that we could take the gospel to the nations. So, Father, would you take what we give right now? Would you take what we give now? Use it for the building of your kingdom and the spread of your gospel across the street and around the world. For the glory of our Savior, we pray. Amen. You can be seated.
I don't know if you're like me or not, but if you go in Chick-fil-A and every once in a while in some other place and um, that song starts playing and I start singing and you were just hoping you weren't singing out loud, that um, people heard you. And um, that happened uh, a week ago Saturday. I was over at Shane's Rib Shack over in Fayetteville and they were playing this classic rock stuff and then all of a sudden that song started playing and I'm like, is that really what I think it is? And uh, anyway, appreciate y'all. Uh, doing that, that song will be stuck in my head all day, and uh, I'm praying that tonight at the Spark Conference we get to sing it um, over here in McDonough. Uh, I invite you to take your copy of the scripture and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. If this is your first time uh, here, I want to just say thank you for being here. Welcome. Um, my name's Art, and I have the, um, the blessing of serving the Southside Baptist Network, which is um, a an association of 84 churches on the southeast side of Atlanta, and uh, and I appreciate the opportunity this church has given me um, for about three and a half months to serve as your interim pastor in the transition. Pastor Don uh, retired a, a few weeks ago after 11 years, and I've um, got a sweet card from him this week, and I uh, think they're doing well, but continue to pray uh, for them. Last week in, in Acts chapter 1, Uh, We encountered the final words of Jesus Christ as he ascended into heaven and he promised the coming of the Holy Spirit and described what it would look like when the church, the people, the believers, the disciples were living out the Great Commission that he had already told them, and we can read about that in Matthew chapter 28, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded, to baptize them. And, um, and he said he would be with us, with them, with us, to the end of the age. And, it, and we started with this statement. If we're obedient to the orders of King Jesus to go, that means that we all are what? Sent. If we're obedient to go, that means we're Sent. And we ended last week with the question, when you came to Jesus Christ, you put your yes on the altar. And the question is, is is your yes on the altar or are you carrying it around in your pocket, waiting to see what the next orders are and see if you like them or not? Or is your yes still on the altar to the commission, to the command of King Jesus to go? And so we find that at the end of chapter 1, the... Disciples uh, return to Jerusalem as Jesus instructed for an extended prayer gathering. And the Bible tells us that there were about 120 present. And at one point, the Apostle Peter uh, decided to stand up in front of the folks there and say, Hey, I think we need to replace Judas, who betrayed Jesus. And you're like, Well, why did he come up with that? Because he knew the prophecy in Psalm chapter 109 verse 8, that said that they would replace the guy who betrayed Jesus. And so he's like, I think we should do that. So they prayed over that. They went through a selection process and chose a guy named Matthias. And in Acts chapter 2, they're continuing to gather and pray. And we come to a day that, um, that we know as Pentecost. And to the Jewish person, it was also called Pentecost, but it would also be called the Festival of Harvest. One of the three main festivals that they celebrated each year it came 50 days after Passover that they celebrated every year. But to the follower of Jesus Christ, it was the day when the prayers of God's people engaged the presence and the power of God's Spirit with the proclamation of the gospel message. And what they saw was not a harvest of food, but they saw a harvest of souls. And I just want to ask us this question as we begin chapter 2. If, if we are sent by King Jesus with the same power of his spirit, do you really believe that we could see a harvest of souls today? And let me just get really specific. Not just today like in these days, in this century, in this decade, in this year. Do you think that we could see a harvest of souls in this place this morning? If we are sent by the same Holy Spirit that brought a harvest of souls 
on that day, do you think that we could see a harvest of souls today? Let's read God's word together, verse 1. We're going to do just a little different today. We're going to go through all 41, the first 41 verses, but we're going to do it a section at a time. And so uh, here we go. I have five things I want to point out from the text today. So we'll do it in five chunks and then get to the end and try to bring it all together. Uh, verse 1, chapter 2, when the, Holy, uh, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. I want you to see first the power of engagement. When you and I engage the Holy Spirit of God that he has given to us as believers, what happens? We see here in this text that prayer is the vehicle for engaging the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because it displays our dependence on him. When we pray and we're asking God for help, we're displaying our dependence on God and God says, I, I can work with that. When we say, I, want to, I can just do it all by myself, God says, well, obviously you don't need me or you don't think you need me. Does that make sense? When we pray and we ask God for help, we're engaging the power of the Holy Spirit. And engaging the Holy Spirit is engaging the power and holiness of God. And, and, and so I appreciate, I, I, didn't, I didn't tell them what songs to sing this morning, but I appreciate that last song. It's called Holy Forever. God is holy forever. When we engage the Holy Spirit of God, we're engaging His holiness. And that is described in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 28 as fire. When Moses, in the Old Testament, engaged the presence of God, he engaged him as fire. There's something purifying about fire. It describes the holiness of God. So I want you to think about that when you're thinking about, I want to pray and ask God to help. I'm engaging his holiness, which means holiness cannot exist where sin is. So when you engage God's holiness, what it does is it causes us to have to deal with our sin. Engaging the Holy Spirit through prayer, as we see here in this text, often results in what is humanly unexplainable. I've had the ability and the opportunity to travel uh, to countries where they don't speak English. Anybody in here traveled to countries where they don't speak English before? You ever sat in a restaurant wishing you could speak that language? You're like, what is that? You're afraid if you order something, you're like, I'll have that. And you're like, because you just don't want to look like a tourist. And so you're like, I I'll just have that. And you're, but you're really afraid the whole time. In, in, in Spanish, anything that says polo says chicken. So I'm like, okay, that's relatively safe. I have prayed in a restaurant before. I have prayed in a foreign country. I have prayed in an airport where I got pulled aside by the security people. God, would you let me speak Spanish? Would you let me speak Ukrainian? Would, would you let... Uh, and he just didn't answer that prayer. But you know, I've prayed personally and with others for healing, and I've seen miracles happen. And even more than physical healing and miracles, I, I've prayed personally and with others for the salvation of individuals, and I've watched God do the miracle and change their life. Stuff I couldn't do that the Holy Spirit of God and the power of God can do. And what we know is, is that 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that it's not God's will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And when you pray for someone to come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are praying in the will of God. There are times when I, I want things to happen in my life to make my life more comfortable. Um, I, I want God to do things in my kids' lives I, that might make them what I think is better. And I really don't know if it's the will of God. But when I pray, 
when I pray for someone to come to faith in Jesus, when I pray for that harvest of souls, and as I lead our network of churches, I say this all the time, we're praying for and working toward a movement of the gospel. When I pray for that and when I work toward that, I know for sure I am working and praying the will of God. That God wants that to happen. The power of Holy Spirit engagement is found in Holy Spirit dependency. Because I don't have the power to change a life. But he does. Let's continue verse 5. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, so that people around them heard the sound, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of these speaking Galileans? All, all the people speaking were Galileans? How, how is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who lived in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, in Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts. When it says that, there were people who were natives to, uh, to Israel, to, to Jewish families, and there were those who were converts to Judaism that had come from all over the world, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They weren't ordering dinner. They were talking about the incredible acts of God. And they were astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. There's always going to be somebody, when God shows up, someone's going to be a critic. But I want you to see here in this text the power of translation. The, the power of translation. Every time I hear that word translation, the, the, the movie Lost in Translation comes to my mind. And I've never even seen it, but it just happens. I, I know how things sometimes get translated bad just in English. I know what it's like to talk to people from different parts of the country and, you know, how we say something, they say something. It's, but think about what it would be like to gather with people who don't know English and you can speak and they understand. In a way, Acts 1-8 was occurring right in front of them. The gospel to every ethnicity right in front of them. And what's amazing was is that many of the people who had come to worship in Jerusalem weren't even allowed in the, in the worship places. There was ethnic, racial tension. There, there were all kinds of issues that people were dealing with. And for some reason, God showed himself and said, I want the gospel, though, to go to everybody. And I'm going to use people, even in their weakness and in their inabilities to make that happen. Some, some people believe that um, the disciples um, were able to speak other languages. Like I would be, you know, going to a group of people who spoke French. And beyond what I learned in French class in high school, where I could say, parlez-vous français? Do you speak French? Je parle français un peu. I speak just a little, and that's it. That's all I, I mean, I can count to 10, but that's about it. But I could go into a room with French people, and for some reason, I could immediately speak fluent French. And some people believe that's kind of what was happening here, that these Galileans, these uneducated men and women, were able to speak in other languages. And some people believe that uh, in this case, they, they were just speaking directly, and everybody heard it in their language. But I just want you to think about it. Either one of those is a miracle that none of them could explain. None of them could have done it in their own ability. The Holy Spirit of God took the message of God and translated it to the people of the world to draw all men, as the Bible says, to himself. The power of translation. Uh, last Monday, uh, I got to spend about three hours in an ordination council with a pastor from Vietnam. He speaks Vietnamese and he speaks some English. And, and in the middle of this process, he's, he's one of the pastors in our network, a new pastor. And we, we were ordaining him how to, you know, 
questioning him. And, and somebody reminded us about 30 minutes in that Vietnamese is his native tongue. And when we talk to him in English, he has to translate it to Vietnamese. Think about how he would respond in Vietnamese and then turn around and translate it back to us in English. Can you imagine? I mean, he's doing it in theology terms, right? The power of God on that day, through the power and engagement of the Holy Spirit of God with the message of God, it's almost like he just breathed it out. And they all understood. I, I, I just said, think about it this way. It, was, it would be kind of like Uncle Cy from Duck Dynasty. Standing in front of the United Nations and talking the way with his little teacup. He doesn't drink sweet tea, by the way. Ask him. He doesn't. It was disappointing to me. He's like, do you think we had sugar in Vietnam? And, but imagine him standing in front of the United Nations with no translators and talking Uncle Cy and everybody understanding. This is what it was like. And the truth is that God can use unexpected people to communicate his gospel, including you. For some of us, we think... Man, my neighbor, I just don't relate to them. Do you know God could use you to communicate his gospel message to them and take the weakness you feel through the power of the Holy Spirit and communicate the gospel in a way they could understand it and come to faith? Some people look at this text and they're like, well, I wonder what language is going to be spoken in heaven. Here's the thing. If you think that we're going to go to heaven and sing Amazing Grace in English and everybody else is just going to have to adapt, you probably have a really wrong view. There have been songs for millennia. There are songs we haven't sung yet. We're all going to be able to gather around the throne of God and sing in harmony together. And you're not going to care what style it is, and neither am I. Whatever style honors the king is all that matters. What I love is that we have so many tools today for gospel proclamation. I have an app on my phone called One Cross. It's free, developed by the Baptists of Texas. And if I were sitting on a plane like I was the other day and I was sitting next to somebody who spoke a different language or in a car like I was on Thursday afternoon with a guy from Uganda and my Lyft driver was a Ugandan, I could have gone to my app and clicked Ugandan and in, for three minutes he could have listened to someone in his native language tell how they came to faith in Jesus, explain the gospel and ask him if he wanted to trust I mean, the, te the, the tools we have today are so incredible. But on that day, the tool was the Holy Spirit of God translating the message of God. And the power of the Holy Spirit translation is found in communicating a Holy Spirit message. Verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all the residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. I guess if it were later in the day, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. Uh, on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. We talked about that last week. And the prophet Joel said this day was coming. And it, it will be in the last days, uh, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before 
uh, the great and glorious day of the Lord comes, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? I love this, and you, you and I should hear this well, but the power of Scripture. This uneducated fisherman named Peter stands up and just tells them what they've already learned through the Holy Spirit giving the word of God through the prophet Joel. And he says, this day was going to come. I'm trying to explain to you, but I don't have to explain it to you. God has explained it to us in his word. He didn't have to use human intelligence or logic to explain what was happening. He just told them from the scripture that they knew this was coming to pass. And I know that most of us today have the struggle that we live in a generation where people don't know what the Bible says. I mean, we used to, when I was in school, and I know it was ages ago, but we actually read the Bible occasionally in school. And I know that doesn't happen in most schools today. You, you don't learn the scriptures. A lot of people, it's one of the reasons I appreciate Awana. Two of my children came to faith in Christ through Awana. I appreciate uh, investing the word of God in children so they grow up knowing. But he simply told them what they knew. And we must start, though, where people are. See, there are people in our, in our world who don't even know there was a God who created the world. And a God who made human beings in his own image. To love and have a relationship with him. And that sin, early on, broke that relationship. And because of that, the holiness of God and the sin of man, that relationship is broken. And then God, throughout what we read in all the Old Testament, is working toward, toward the time when he would send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross. The perfect son of God. To die on a cross for you and for me. To bridge that gap as that song living hope talks about how he bridged that chasm between us made a way for us to know him people don't know that we got to start where they are and you may not know how to do that where to, but just start with god's word and just trust that the holy spirit of god uses the word of god to bridge that gap to people as Ephesians 6 tells us, the Bible is the belt of truth that holds everything in place. But I do want you to remember one thing. That the Bible does teach us in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is a sword. That's two-edged, that, that really does heart work on us, surgery on us. But it's the Spirit of God that does that work it's not our job to take the word of God and try to beat people up with it we're to do it with compassion as people who who have been saved by the grace of God too and the power of the Holy Spirit engagement is always linked to the power of scripture that's why I love the, the book by Donald Whitney that is taught just called simply praying the Bible because I know when I'm praying God's word, I'm praying God's will. Continuing verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. The G this Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to by uh, God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him. Just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge... You used lawless people, talking about the Romans, to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David said, so he's going to go quote scripture again in King David. Uh, for David said of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. Because he was at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. And he's talking here about the prophecy of Jesus that he would not be in the grave long enough for his body to decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence, brothers and sisters. Now Peter's talking again, not quoting David. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. 
And since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants upon the throne. That's why Jesus was called, the, the Messiah would be called the son of David. He was of that lineage. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades. His flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus, and we are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord. So God said of his son, Jesus, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. I don't know about you, but if I read all the Gospels, for Peter, that was pretty good. I mean, this is the same Peter who, you know, a couple months earlier, actually a little less than just under two months earlier, had told Jesus, yeah, you, I'm, you're never going to die. I, I'm not going to let you die. This ain't going to happen. And Jesus looked at him and said, get behind me, Satan. If, if you... If you look at what Peter was like, and then you're like, dude, I mean, how did that happen? Only because of the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And if God can do that in his life, imagine what he could do in yours. Imagine what he could do with you. The power of the gospel is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Peter reminded him who Jesus was and what they had witnessed him do. He, he declared that through, though uh, the Jews orchestrated Christ's death, that it was God's plan. God used you. It was bad what you did, but it was God's plan that he would come and that he would die. He reminded them that King David declared accurately about Jesus that he would not see decay. Peter challenged them to look at Christ, not to a dead prophet you know how many of the world's religions follow a dead prophet we don't follow a dead prophet we follow a risen king and lord and his name is Jesus this Jesus the same Jesus he preached almost 2,000 years ago is the same Jesus that we declare today same Jesus, same power, same Holy Spirit, same ability to change a life, same ability to forgive sin and to give eternal life because he defeated death and the grave. And Peter joined with the others who witnessed the risen Christ and verified that he is alive. And I wrote this statement down, the proof of the prophecy and the proof of Messiah declared the power declared in the power of the spirit he, he took what the word of God said what he had experienced personally and through the power of the Holy Spirit he proclaimed it to others and God has asked us in fact he's called us to do the exact same thing take what the Bible says tell of our own experience how God's changed our lives and through the power of the Holy Spirit God will use it to change other people's lives listen listen you know that the number one person that people turn to for theology in the United States today is Oprah Winfrey. I am not joking. I'm telling you the truth. More people get their theology from Oprah than any other source in the United States. And I listened to her the other night tell people that there are many ways to God and that we shouldn't tell them that we have the only way. I listened to her say it from a platform on national TV. Listen, Jesus Christ is still the only way. And if he is not the only way, he's not any way at all. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So if he was lying about that, he's not any way to God. But if he's telling the truth, and he is, he is the only way to God. And he provided that way. And he proved his love for us 
that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, he died for us. He didn't say, y'all should just be better people. He said, no, there's no way you could be better people. So I'm going to die for you to pay for your sin so that you could have a relationship with God. That's Jesus. And the power of the Holy Spirit engagement always focuses on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will testify of me. In the last section, verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For, he prom for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. Listen what it says. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. The power of response. The power of a response. I, I've thought about, I wonder when we when we get to heaven, get heaven and gather around the throne, do you ever wonder who was first? Out of all that, who was the first one? And on that day, who was the last one? The first time I ever baptized people, there were 17. Baptized the chairman of the deacons who said I was raised in church but never repented of my sin and trusted in Christ alone. I was trusting religion and just being a good person. And he was in his 50s at the time. That day, 17 people. And I thought I had to go fast. So I was like, boom, boom. I mean, it was like five, less than five minutes I baptized 17 people. I mean, I was talking like the end of those drug commercials where, you know, it says, all those really fast things, all those side effects you don't know is, are coming. I felt like I was talking that fast. Just, but how, can you imagine 3,000? My good friend Don, um, every year, a few times a year, he goes to Ethiopia. and God, There's a movement of God there. And I asked him one time, because I, I heard, I said, what's, what's it like to have 100,000 people show up and over 20,000 get saved in one day, and then baptized, same day. He's like, it's pretty cool. That happened just two months ago, again. It's happening all over the world. Do you think it could happen here? The Holy Spirit is the one who pierced the hearts, calls them to ask how to respond. Peter's the one who pointed them to respond to Christ. He didn't say, respond to me. He said, trust Jesus. Some people get confused about the thing where it says, uh, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the rem remission or the forgiveness of sins. And the word for there is the, the Greek word uh, spelled E-I-S, and it means because of. Translation, right? It means because of. So repent and then be baptized because of the remiss. Because you've been forgiven, be baptized. If you want clarity on that, go, go on over in the book of Acts and we'll get there where Philip, the Ethiopian, says, how is it that, why can't I be baptized? And he had already trusted in Christ. And he wanted to know, why can't I be baptized? Today, most people are asking the question, why should I? Do I have to? In the early church, it was just assumed. Why wouldn't I be? What, if I'm going to follow Christ, why would I not do what he asked? I put my yes on the altar. That was me, though, out of religious pride. Four years went by after I trusted Christ before I followed in baptism. I regret every day of it. And after I followed in Christ and believer's baptism, God just started doing stuff in my life that I hadn't experienced before. 
Because you got to be obedient. See, here's the thing. You don't get to press skip button on obedience to God. This is true. I mean, this is, this is so true. God says you should do this, and you don't do that. You're like, well, can you go to the next thing and see? Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll be obedient to the next thing. No, God says, I, I told you to do this. And God doesn't press the skip button and say, well, let's try something else. Because he's king and he's Lord. And the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, he says, is a gift. It's not something you buy. And you get the gift of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And he calls us to repent and believe. And the gospel was presented with clarity and with passion. I love what it says. It says he urged them. He urged them. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that we're ambassadors and we plead with you. Be reconciled to God. We plead with you. We urge you. Be reconciled to God. 3,000 one day. Let me ask you a question. Do you think 10 could get saved today? Do you believe it? I, I want to share this one story and then I'm done. Here, here's the deal. It's the fall of 2019. And I'm pastoring a church and we've started seeing some people come to faith in Christ and it seems like, you know, there's a little momentum. And one Sunday morning in September... Um, I stood at the front, and nine people like that came to trust Christ. And, um, and for the next 20 minutes, while my worship leader is like, okay, what do I do next? What do I do next? I counseled all nine of them. And I was a bit, like, upset afterwards. Like, nobody would help me. No, nobody came to help. And there were two things that happened. Number one, the one thing that happened, people weren't comfortable sharing the gospel. And I'm like, okay, we got to fix that. Here was the other. They had never seen it before. And maybe some of you have never seen a movement of the gospel where multiple, maybe 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 people came to Christ in one day. Maybe you've never seen it. But I promise you, once you have seen it, you long to see it again. And as a church, I just want to challenge you. If you want to see a movement of God in the gospel, pray for it, prepare for it, expect it. Because the Holy Spirit of God wants people to come to faith. He wants people to trust Him. And when we pray for it and we prepare for it, God will send it. The power of the Holy Spirit's engagement always prompts a response. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, you're not a follower of Christ, maybe the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you today and, and it's like, this is your day. Maybe this is your day. We're, we're about to sing a song and it just says, turn your eyes upon Jesus and maybe today... The Holy Spirit of God spoke and said, this is the day you need to trust Jesus. You need to repent of your sin. That just means turning from following your own way and put your faith, your whole faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died for you, was resurrected on the third day to give you eternal life. And this is your day. Would you accept the gospel message and believe in Christ today? Not later today, like now. And if you're a follower of Christ are you engaging the Holy Spirit of God with the scriptures of God, with the gospel message of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit he's given you? Are you engaging it to live sent? And maybe for you today, it's, I need to get focused back on what's most important to God. And that's, for me, someone he's delivered from death and sin and hell to be an ambassador for the gospel. And you'd like to just come and kneel and pray. and um, You know, for some churches, the, the altar, for some reason, has become this place that's like, you know, no, no, not. Look. I'm going to risk it here, okay? 
If you've let the altar become that and you're a follower of Christ, what you're doing is you're hindering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as a follower of Christ, I need to repent all the time. Not get re-saved. I, I need to repent. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if, I, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. Forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's written to believers. Uh, he's still working in me. And I need this. And I would just tell you, if the altar has become a place for you, it's like, nah, we don't do that around here. Then you're hindering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to encourage you. Use it. Use the altar. Have an altar somewhere where you pray. And you, you talk to God and engage God. Engage the Holy Spirit. It's that important. Because we can't accomplish anything without him. But with him. There's nothing that can't be accomplished. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. I pray even now that we would turn our eyes and look at you, that we would focus on you, that we would respond to you. I pray for that person who's in the room who's never trusted Christ, the Savior. I pray right now would be the time when they would do that. Maybe they would come and just say, hey, Pastor, or someone else, Pastor House, it, someone else here, that I, I, will you help me know how to trust Christ? We'd be love to do that. Maybe someone here is praying for a lost child, parent, spouse. Lord, would you um, help us to respond to your word in the spirit today in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing together? praying up here. Why don't you bow your head for just a moment? Can I just ask you a question? Every, every head bowed, every eye closed in the place. Let's just honor the folks who are 
who are responding right now. I, can I ask you this question? Why nobody's looking around? Uh, not even our worship team. They're not. They're not looking. Just, just me. Is there somebody in the place here today who would say, um, "I'm struggling with the courage to," but I, I sense God is working in my heart, and I, I need to trust Christ. And just say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Um, I, I sense God's calling me, and I just, I need to do business with God. And would you pray for me today and this week? If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Amen. Thank you. Anybody in the room who just says, you know, I'm just done. Today, I want to trust Christ. Today, I'm trusting Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'm believing that he died for me, that he was risen from the dead, that he paid for my sin, and I'm repenting of my sin and turning my life over to Jesus right now. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and say, I'm trusting him right now. Amen. All right, you can be seated for just, just for a moment. I don't want to ruin what's uh, happening, but um, just, just a couple of things. First of all, First of all, thanks for those who signed up to be, participate in the Spark Conference tonight at Glen Haven Baptist Church. Uh, when service started, there were about close to 900 signed up already for that. It's going to be a great evening. There's uh, brochures back here if you'd like to sign up for that. Um, it is $15 because it includes dinner, and if that's an issue for you, you let uh, Pastor House know that today, and he'll sign you up and take care of that for you, and happy to do that. Um, Next Sunday, uh, no, two weeks from today, um, the ladies' ministry is having their cookie decorating, and that's going to be in the youth room. But um, they, uh, there are supplies to be purchased for that, and so they just ask if by next Sunday, the first, if you were planning to come, that you would sign up and pay for that so they can take care of that. And then I just want to remind you that the pastor search prayer today, we're on day 21. The pastor search team is Galatians 5.18. And that's to pray that we as the church and they as the search team would be filled with and led by the Holy Spirit of God. And I would ask you to pray that who God has already sovereignly chosen to be the next pastor of this church, that even now, that they would be in a time where they're hearing the word of God and they're hearing the voice of God. In their own life so when he tells them this is time for you to come here they're used to hearing it because don't you want a pastor who hears from God that's what you need that's what I need father would you go with us now as we leave this place do your best work in us and through us for the glory of the one who gave all for us Jesus Christ and I pray in his name and all of God's people said Amen. you are sent